Brother Brady, for that song. That last word, Emmanuel. So we've been looking at this Christmas season, Emmanuel, God with us. If you have your Bibles, open to Matthew chapter 1. We'll be right there, Matthew chapter 1 and Matthew chapter 2 tonight as we look at another reason for the season, Emmanuel, God with us. I'm thankful for Christmas time for a number of reasons. Thankful for Christmas time, it's a tremendous time with family. I enjoy the time away from school and uh, some other responsibilities to spend time with family. Growing up, we had Christmas parties all of the time, not with others, with our own family. And when you have seven kids plus two parents in one house, you can have a party. We had them all the time. Coming to First Baptist Church, many of you make treats for us and, uh, and for our family, and uh, we uh, always enjoy those treats. And boy, it's party time all the time, Christmas time. Enjoy Christmas time because of the ability to give and receive presents. The Bible says it is more blessed to give than to receive, though most of us have an element of enjoyment in receiving as well. But there is a lot of joy in giving, you know as well as I do, for children, for others, for friends. Enjoy Christmas because of the holiday festivities. I love Christmas music. I love the carols. I love the Christmas songs. I love Christmas lights. It's just a very festive time of year. But I love Christmas because of the focus around the Christmas story. Tremendous portion of Scripture in Matthew chapter 1 and 2 and Luke chapter 1 and 2 as well. Tremendous truths that we can glean and find. And this year we're looking at that truth, Emmanuel, God with us. Look in Matthew chapter number 1, where the verse is repeated as we look at this morning from Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14. The book of Isaiah, given to Isaiah the prophet a prophecy. And here the angel repeats it to Joseph. In Matthew chapter 1, verse, beginning in verse 22, now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. What an amazing unbelievable, life-changing thought that the God of the universe would foretell and then do that thing to dwell among men. We looked at this morning because of God with us, our God is reliable, or what He says He will do. What God says it will always come true, maybe not today and maybe not tomorrow, but it is true. God will always do what he says he will do. Emmanuel, God with us, it brings us power to have the God of the universe dwell among men, brings power to your life and to my life. God with us is a tremendous promise that was fulfilled, and God with us is a tremendous provision. Emmanuel, that little name and maybe word in a Christmas song that we sing through as another Christmas term. There's lots of Christmas terms in songs that ought to be sung through. Fa la 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 la. You can sing it through. It'll not change your life. I promise. Frosty the snowman. You can sing right through that one. Sing it happily, but, but woe unto the Christian who sings through the thought in the name of Jesus, Emmanuel. Because of that name, because of that promise, your life and my life is forever altered and changed. My life is different. Your life is different. It is fundamentally different because of Emmanuel, God with us. We looked at this morning, the reliability. Tonight, I want to begin to look at some of the responses, the responses around the Christmas story, around of this concept, Emmanuel, God with us. And tonight, I want to look at the wise men. Now, Pastor Ryan did a tremendous job of the shepherds. We'll look at them a little bit later on. I already had my message written when he preached. He did a great job Wednesday night. If you missed it, go back on YouTube and watch it. We're blessed to have a tremendous and a, and a, well, a well-equipped staff here at First Baptist Church. But I love the wise men. The wise men will forever be a testimony to you and to me. They'll forever be an example of commitment, fortitude, and selflessness. Often depicted at the nativity, but we know better. We know better. We know they never made it to the manger. And we in judgment pass the nativity and say, <laughs> look at the wise men by the nativity. 
Now, they weren't at the nativity. They weren't in the manger, at the manger with the baby Jesus. But it doesn't offend me to see them there as I drive down the street. It doesn't offend me. Some of you, oh, I know my Bible so much better than these commoners around me. No, I know where they showed up. They showed up at the house of Jesus, all right? He was about two to three years old. I know that. But it doesn't bother me that much when I drive down the road and there's a whole nativity set and there's Mary and Joseph and the shepherds and a cow and everything else, and they're the shepherds with their camels out front. Because it's not a bad thing to be reminded of the wise men. In fact, if we didn't have a nativity, where, where would we set them up anyway? We build a separate house and put a title over it, the baby Jesus, two to three years old here, and then put the wise men up? Is that what we would do? Is, is that what you have us to do? Uh, would you have a little disclaimer around their neck, all right, around the nativity set? They weren't really here. All right, don't give them too much credit. They didn't make it here in time. Is that what you'd have us to do? No, no, we can learn a lot from the wise men. The wise men have touched my life in a few different ways, and I'll forever be different because of the wise men and the account of the wise men. Shown often in groups of three, are they not? Three camels, three wise men, taken because of the three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But you Bible scholars know that there are definitely more than three. So it, as you pass these nativity, not only do you say they weren't really there, you say, well, well, children, there were more than three. There could have been six. <laughs> there were probably a whole bunch more than six. This was a long journey. These were very wealthy individuals. The wise men, a group of men that probably had their roots back to Daniel in Babylon. 400 plus years studying these things, or longer, and even longer from that. And we, we often show them in groups of three because how could you really depict all the wise men around the manger scene? You know, if you're going to mess up the story, mess it up completely, right? You know, put a thousand wise men out there, it doesn't really matter. For some, it was a brief quest. For others of these wise men, a lifelong quest. I want to look at tonight the wise men, the response of the wise men, and glean some truths for your life and for my life. I wouldn't mind being listed among the wise men in the Christmas story. I wouldn't mind being the donkey. Just saying. To have even a small part in the Christmas story, what a tremendous honor. For all the things that these wise men accomplished in their life, I can think of nothing greater than to travel and worship Jesus Christ. And in your life and in my life, I can think of nothing greater than to travel and to worship Jesus Christ. If you knew Jesus was going to be in town, would you go and see him? If you found out they were selling tickets, would you try to buy one or would you put it off? Well, I'll buy one outside. I'm sure there'll be a lot available. If you knew that it would cost you a, a whole heap of money, would you spend it to go see Jesus? Would you spend it? If you knew that it would take you away from your family and your friends for two plus years, would you still go? Well, look at tonight. The response of the wise men, Lord, I thank you for loving us and thank you for this time. Lord, help us. Help us to see some of these truths from the lives of these wise men. Lord, some truths that will, I believe, help us grow as we worship you. Lord, may we come to you with the same commitment, the same selflessness, the same fortitude that the wise men displayed Thank you for their story, Lord. Thank you for their faith. Lord, I ask you to help us during this time of our hearts to be touched by your Spirit. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. Look with me, if you would please, in Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2 begins the, the wise man account. The very first verse now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. 
want to notice three things about the wise men tonight, three truths about the, the wise men, three characteristics that I believe ought to be evident in your life and in my life. Beginning of this chapter, chapter 2 of Matthew, we have just this verse, these wise men came from the east. We'll go on at a later time and read perhaps the, the account of the wise men where they went to Herod and they asked Herod uh, where he was and, and Herod with his deception and his insecurity, all right, um, found out and from that ended up killing young children in Bethlehem, ended up trying to deceive the wise men. But I want to pause for a moment tonight and look at these wise men as they rolled into Jerusalem, this was not just a casual occurrence. This was not just a small feat. These wise men came into Jerusalem and began to ask, where is he that is born king of the Jews? It caused such a stir, such a consternation, that uh, in verse number 3, eventually Herod the king heard these things and was troubled, and all Jerusalem troubled with him. These men rolled into town, and it's why one reason I would say there were more than three. Jerusalem was not a small city. It was a large city. And if one or two or three guys begin to ask, where's, where's he that's born king of the Jews, it may cause a little stir. But if there was a large caravan of obvious, obvious uh, wealth and obvious uh, of just accomplishment, camels and servants, and its supplies to last for a two-year journey. And this big thing, this big caravan, caused quite the stir in Jerusalem. And eventually the king, Herod, heard wind of it. But, but I want you to notice that the wise men asked this question, where is he that is born? King of the Jews, verse number two, for we have seen his star in the east. There's an attribute of the wise men that I think we ought to replicate. And that is the wise men were very studied. The wise men had an incredible thirst and hunger and knowledge of the prophecy, and if I can, of the Word of God. I will not take the time now. I've in past preached on the promises and the prophecies that these wise men looked at. And to put these things together was not just a casual acquaintance or a casual observation from the Word of God. It took some diligence. It took some work. It took some study. It took some understanding of the Word of God. And they were so studied, they were so diligent in their study that when they saw this star in the east, they packed up everything and came from at least 600 miles, 600 miles from Babylon to Jerusalem, 800 if they came from Persia. The gifts that they brought, gold and frankincense and myrrh, were, were very famous from Arabia. They probably came from that area. And my friends, you can never be like the wise men if the only time you crack open your Bible is at church. You'll never be like the wise men if you just have a casual acquaintance with the Word of God. I look at the wise men and I see a challenge to know the Word of God, to study the Word of God, to love the Word of God. We're coming under the new year, and I'm sure some point in January or February, I'll challenge us again to spend time in God's Word every single day. The wise men did not just have a casual acquaintance or a little observation. Boy, they were studied. They had some commitment. You'll never be like the wise men if you think commitment is just coming to church. That's like the first step, if I may. Coming to church, boy, some Christians think, wow, I'm in church. I'm obviously a really good Christian. Coming to church doesn't make you a good Christian any more than sitting in a refrigerator makes you a cucumber. You ought to want to come to church because you're a Christian. I want to come to the house of God with the people of God, to worship God because I have Christ in my heart. And we live in a day and age where the commitment level of Christians is at an all-time low. But it's not just Christians. Let's not stop there. Humanity in general is a very uncommitted people. The thing that is sacred, marriage, people divorce, and it's easy. Maybe you saw those billboards a while back on I-75. What was it? Dumpmyspouse.com? 
As easy as going to a website, it seems. How shallow a people we must be. And that shallowness has bled over to our jobs, bled over to our families, but it has bled over to our Christianity. We lack the commitment that I read about in the book of Acts. This past week, I've been in the book of Acts in my devotions. And I tell you, I'm going to preach a message later on, so get excited when I get there. There are two statements from the book of Acts that I, that I noticed from the apostles. Statement number one, they had a God worth living for. Number two, they had a God worth dying for. Every single day they woke up with a threat of death, tossed into jail, beaten, and stood before magistrates and kings, dragged from crowds, thrown around all over the place, and yet, you know what they did the very next day? They got up and did it all over again. Commitment. Commitment. And yet there's too much snow outside, and we're done. We won't even take that step to church. COVID-19. We won't take that step to church. Commitment. I look at the wise men, and I see some commitment to the word of God and to God himself. You want to be like the wise men? Take some commitment to right here. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You say, well, pastor, you've mentioned that verse before. Absolutely, and I'll mention it again. If you gain one thing from being at church, I hope, I hope you gain this, that you ought to go home and study and read your Bible. God's gift to mankind, his revelation of himself in this book, he reveals himself. Without this book, we don't even know the name of God. Because of this book, we know the names of God. They knew there was a God, the, the creator, but it was introduced to us, his name was introduced to us at the burning bush to Moses. Moses said, the first time his name is mentioned, who shall I say sent me? And he said, I am that I am, Jehovah, Yahweh in the Hebrew, the name of God. Without that, we don't know his name, and his names don't stop there. We have so many names of God, character of God, and here in this portion of Scripture, Emmanuel, God with us, there was a study there, a commitment. The wise men show me that you ought to be committed to knowing God. I'm teaching the seniors right now, I see some of you here tonight, we're looking at what's called theology proper, the actual study of God himself. And there are some ways to show that there is something bigger out there than me some other arguments, some other ways to prove the existence of a God, a deity. That only brings us to this point to I can show you the God when you open the Bible. I shared today with my family that I have, a, I have an alien movie theory. An alien movie theory. I will explain to you my alien movie theory. If you notice that almost every alien movie that's ever been written from way or ever been, ever been created always has aliens as extremely powerful and a superior race to humans. You never have a movie where the aliens show up and they're little earthworms. And a little five-year-old, end of, end of invasion, they're gone. No, 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 it's always this superior race has come down and, and is afflicting humanity and humanity barely escapes. Barely outsmarts the superior race. You know why I believe that is? I believe the Bible tells us that, that inside of all of us, Romans chapter 1, we know that it's created inside all of us that we know that there is something bigger than me out there. And yet many reject God. And they say it must be an alien. <laughs> My friend, it's not an alien. It's the God, creator of the universe. His name is Jehovah. He is a God. He is a creator. He is a, he is a savior. And the wise men studied. Not only did I notice that they studied, but they sacrificed tonight. They left their homes. They left their families. Wandering about in strange lands, in unknown places, for a two- to three-year journey. Lodging, food, survival. The fact is, a lot of us, if we're honest, we live paycheck to paycheck. We could no more take this journey than we could go to the moon. 
Yet the wise men, when they saw this star in the east, they packed up their things and they began to go see Jesus. The first Christmas was obviously a time of sacrifice. Consider for a moment the sacrifices that were made for the first Christmas. You had Mary and her reputation. She became pregnant without being married. She sacrificed her reputation. In fact, I would argue from later on in Scripture that throughout Jesus' life, that reputation followed him. Mary sacrificed her reputation to follow God. It cost Mary and Joseph the security of a home during the time of exile in Egypt to protect the little babe. It cost mothers and fathers a child all around Bethlehem as the lives of many children were slain in an unsuccessful attempt by Herod to eliminate Jesus. It cost the, the shepherds the comfort of that night and their sheep as they followed the call to the manger. It cost the wise men a long journey and expensive gifts to worship the Christ child. But it cost the Savior of the world 33 years of life to live on earth a shameful death before the final victory was won. And if we for a moment think that living for God will not cost us anything, then we will be sadly mistaken. We may not pay the same price as someone else. We may not pay the same price as a martyr as we see Stephen in, in the book of Acts or martyrs across the world today. But following God will cost us something. And in the story of the wise men, I see their sacrifice. Boys, we're going on a trip. How far are we going? We're not sure. How long will it take? No idea. Where's the destination? That way. I'm in. Right after college, I had the opportunity to go on a road trip with a few friends. Only time in my life that I've done this, then they happen to really enjoy baseball. And they said, J.D., listen, you graduated, we graduated, you're starting at First Baptist Church in June. June the 2nd, I think it was, I started here at First Baptist Church in 2002. And they said, hey, we graduated in May, I think it was May the 8th or so. They said, let's take two or two and a half weeks, and let's just go drive around and visit different baseball parks. As a foolish, naive college graduate, I said, let's go. I said, what tickets are we buying? They said, you know what, we'll figure out when we get there. And that's exactly what we did. It's save one park. Went to see the Boston Red Sox. And at Fenway Park, we had to buy tickets ahead of time or we would not have gotten in. Every other park we drove up to, we looked out front and there were people selling tickets. We bought the tickets outside the park and made our way in. Throughout the game, those nights we went, that was when you used to be able to go to sporting events, uh, we would wind and weave our way down to get as close as we could. Got right behind the dugout a uh, number of games. Went to Pittsburgh. I went to uh, Detroit. Went to, went to Detroit Stadium at that time. Went to Boston. Went to New York. See the New York Yankees play. Had a great time with those, with those boys. Some of my friends from college. And I imagine that these men had a good time, but my trip came to an end. I knew eventually my money was going to run out. We didn't have to spend too much because... I asked them, well, where are we going to stay? And they say, well, we got friends in this city, this city, this city. And we drove up and said, hey, we're coming over. Can we crash at your place? And that's what we did. These wise men, though, prepared for the long journey. They see some sacrifice all around that. I wonder, how long would you travel to go see Jesus? In what circumstances or what would hinder you to go see Jesus? Well, only if I could drive there, but I wouldn't walk there. And I definitely wouldn't ride a camel there. Camels, they tell me, can run up to 40 miles an hour. Pretty quick. But it's like that. They're over. They typically, in these caravans, will travel three to four miles an hour, top speed in a caravan. They're traveling eight 
hundred miles. Hour upon grueling hour on the back of a camel. I don't know about you, but uh, I'm thankful for 2020. Even the worst vehicle is better than a camel. Now, I know some of you animal lovers, oh, no, there's nothing like being one with nature. You're right. There's nothing like it. (laughs) And I'm thankful (laughs) for for how and where we live. But these men, they showed some sacrifice. What would prompt someone to leave the comfort of their homes to go on a dangerous journey? Romance, says some. Sure, romance will cause some to leave their homes. Wealth, no doubt, most definitely, but faith. Faith will cause you to leave your home. Faith will cause you to leave the comfort that you know. Faith will cause you to go see him that is born king of the Jews. They had seen a star. They had the evidence. And now they were on a journey. The only question they had was, where is he? Now, stop and think about this for a moment. They're going to see Jesus, but the only question they had was, where is he? They pack everything up and only have a direction. They know nothing else. That, my friends, is faith. As we follow Jesus Christ, you know what we know? A direction. We don't know what tonight or what tomorrow may hold, but we know who holds tonight and who holds tomorrow. We may not know what tomorrow brings or next week. We don't know if it'll be fame or fortune or poverty. We don't know if it'll be sickness or it'll be health. We don't know, but we do know a direction. And just like the wise men, I want to show the sacrifice that they had. It's interesting, though, they get to Jerusalem. And the scribes knew where Jesus was to be born. Look at me in Matthew chapter 2. In Matthew chapter 2, when they had gathered, verse number 4, all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded as Herod of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. The wise men didn't know where he was at, but they came. The scribes knew where he was at, yet they stayed. My friend, fellow Christian, there's a direction for us. Don't be like the scribes. Be like the wise men. I see study, I see sacrifice, but last night I see a steadfastness. I see a steadfastness. They were going to see the Christ child. They were going to see he who was born king of the Jews. I see steadfastness in the face of adversity. There were hindrances. They were in the wrong place. The star had disappeared. Pastor Lett preaches a tremendous message on following the star. I heard it this way in college. Never doubt in the dark what God has taught you in the light. That particular truth, this particular truth has influenced me more than probably most other truths in God's word. But what I mean by that is this, that that when God shows you something, stay on the course until he shows you something else. Just because it gets dark outside, just because it gets dark inside, it's not the time to quit. It's not the time to stop. It's not the time to quit the journey. It's the time to keep on going, to keep on following the star. The face of adversity. See, in adversity, we often say, well, God, what are you trying to show me? What I find in Scripture is that God grows through adversity. God grows us through adversity. God grows our faith through those trials. He reveals himself before and after. In the face of adversity, I see steadfastness. But then I see it in this, in verse 11, please, if you look there in verse 11. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. Not only is there adversity I see here, I see adoration, I see worship. When they reached their goal, when they came to the house of the baby Jesus, 
They received the opportunity to worship the Son of God. You see, if wise men showed up at our house tomorrow, we would feel like we were honored. If all of a sudden the president were to show up at our house, we would feel like an honored guest. Yet when the wise men showed up, they were the ones who were honored, not Jesus. Jesus was worshipped, but they were honored to be able to give worship to their Lord. You see, if you quit early, you may miss the greatest experience of your life. I imagine the rest of their lives, they told everyone around them about the time they got to worship the Son of God. Imagine as they journeyed back home, there was nothing else on their lips than the experience they had worshiping the Son of God. Can you believe that? Did you see him? Belteshazzar, he smiled at me. No, he was smiling at me. No, 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 no. The baby Jesus, he smiled at me. I saw it clearly. He looked at me. He opened his eyes. Did you see his eyes? Were they not piercing? Did they not seem to go straight into the depths of your soul? Imagine all the way home, they talked about the baby Jesus, and everyone else around them when they got home heard about their experience. I imagine if they were married and had children, that their children heard about it, their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren. They'd gather around for a family event, maybe even a Christmas celebration. Let me tell you about the journey. And the kids would come at their feet. Tell us again, what was it like when he smiled at you? What was it like when you saw the star reappear Oh, tell us that part about Herod, how you tricked that nasty king. Tell us that part again. Oh, you you did a good one on him. Tell us that part again. Of all that they did, nothing was greater than this experience. Don't quit. You may miss the greatest experience of your life. But don't quit. You may miss the greatest act of worship in your life. Of all the worship that they had in their life. I can think of no greater act than to actually kneel before the physical Emmanuel, God with us, on bended knee, face to the ground, and to physically present a gift. Jesus, here's my gold. Here's my frankincense. Here's my myrrh. I'm sure as they traveled, they brought the best they had. They didn't skimp or or bring a frivolous thing. But you have to wonder at that moment when they were in the house with Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus, if this thought did not come through their mind, I wish I brought more. I wish I had one more gold piece. I wish I'd brought another ounce of frankincense. I wish I'd brought a little bit more myrrh. Of all these wise men did, of all they accomplished, nothing in their mind compared to giving a gift and worshiping God. Of all these wise men did, nothing in Scripture is given to them, to these wise men, any better action than their response of worship to Jesus Christ. You see, I see a steadfastness. I see a steadfastness that you and I need. You see, when the magi, the wise men, when they finally found the baby Jesus, do you think they were disappointed? Oh, it's a baby. Oh, look at that. Or were they thrilled? He did not look like a king. His home did not look like a palace or a castle. He had no scepter in his hand. He commanded no armies. There was nothing to make you think that he was a king. To the outward eye, this babe was just a child of a peasant, born in poverty. But to the wise men, he was king. To the wise men, he possessed more royalty in a cradle than Herod possessed in a fine palace. To the wise men, he was greater in his infancy than the greatest king of any nation. He was more powerful than any kingdom they had known. 
It did not seem that way, and the eyes of flesh revealed nothing more than some wise men traveling and following a star to a gurgling and cooing baby. But the wise men saw beyond the child through faith and worshiped a king. The response from the wise men, study, sacrifice, and steadfastness. Or we can sum it up in these two little words, follow him. Wherever he leads, follow him. Don't quit, don't step, just follow him. No matter how long it takes, follow him. Wherever it takes you, follow him. Follow him until you see him. It's important that, that you start right, but it's imperative that you end well. The Greeks had a race in the Olympics. It was a unique race. The winner was not the runner that finished first. It was the runner who finished with his torch still lit. My friend, I want to run all this life with my torch lit for Jesus Christ. Oh, are you following him? There was an Olympic runner from Tanzania. When he came to the stadium, the day's events were almost gone. Most of the spectators had gone home at this point. And limping, limping into the arena, the Tanzanian runner showed pain with every single step, his knee bleeding and bandaged from an earlier fall in the, in the marathon. His ragged appearance immediately caught the attention of the remaining crowd who cheered him on to finish last in the race. Why did he stay in the race? What made him endure his injuries? These questions were asked later on, and he replied this, My country did not send me 7,000 miles to start the race. They sent me 7,000 miles here to finish the race. And my Savior did not come to this earth from the throne of heaven for me to start this race. He came for me to finish this race. And my friend, we can follow Jesus Christ until he comes again, or I go to him in glory. But follow on. Is a road too hard? Follow on. Not have you followed or will you follow, but are you following? We have a lot of past tense Christians. I used to do this. I used to follow. We have some future Christians. I will do this, but I'm looking for present tense Christians who are following Jesus Christ today. The road to Jesus Christ is filled with many exits. Exits of fear, convenience, wealth, distraction. But only one leads to Jesus Christ. Story of the wise men, follow him. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for these wise men who show to me tremendous truth. Lord, help us to not be uncommitted, past tense or future Christians. But Lord, may we presently follow on and follow you. Lord, we don't know what tonight will hold or tomorrow will bring, but we can follow you. My friend, if you're here tonight, God touch your heart. Are you tempted to be distracted? Have you been swayed from the journey? Maybe the journey seemed too hard. Maybe it seemed too long. Maybe you're distracted or discouraged because you don't know exactly where it ends up like the wise men. My friend, you can follow on. You can follow that star. You can follow it. The greatest event in their life, I believe, was worshiping the baby Jesus. And they never would have gotten there if they'd stopped early. My friend, maybe tonight, you need to come forward to a simple altar and say, God, I need to follow on. Maybe you're at home. Maybe you need to say, God, I need to follow on. Lord, bless this invitation. May we respond to the way you've touched us. In Jesus' name, amen.